Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Our next guest, Ray Comfort, is the founder, president, and CEO of Living Waters Publications. After relocating from New Zealand to Southern California in the late 80s, Ray introduced a long line of pastors and churches to a biblical teaching which he called Hell's Best Kept Secret. The positive and enthusiastic response that followed Ray's Living Water Publications ministry took it to a whole new level. From humble beginnings, LWP has become an internationally recognized ministry, reaching the lost and equipping Christians with every necessary resource to fulfill the Great Commission. Ray is the co-host with Kirk Cameron of the award-winning television program, The Way of the Master, which airs in 123 countries around the world. He's the best-selling author of more than 70 books. He and his wife, Sue, live in Southern California, where they have three children. Here to discuss his breakthrough expose on suicide, entitled The Final Curtain, Fame, Fortune, and Feudal Lives, is Ray Comfort. Ray, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Well, thank you for having me on your program. I appreciate it. Well, we and realize that book is two books in one. There's another book on the other side, which is upside down, which means you can read it with your wife or spouse at a table. She can read one side, you can read the other side, so it's great for marriage. It, it uh, absolutely is. Ray, uh, many of your books uh, have been about reaching in new, exciting, provocative, and even simplistic ways of presenting the gospel. So you've gone from the simple to the complex to the deep dive. Uh, and just yesterday, I was able to lead someone to the Lord using your foundational, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen something? And what defines good? And how are you going to get into the kingdom of heaven? And this young man said yes to the Lord based on that simple equation that has been so profound. But you have touched on in this book, and not just touched on, but done a deep dive in the final curtain, fame, fortune, feudal lives, uh, because of what has been in the news, so prevalent in the news and so shocking, are the lives which are being taken by suicide. Why was this an issue that <clears throat> you decided to tackle? How have you been approaching it? And what is it that you want to equip people to understand about those who are in such despair that they would want to take their own lives? Well, I couldn't do nothing. We have an epidemic of suicide. 45,000 people kill themselves every year in the U.S. That's a stadium full of people. And something like a half a million people actually attempt to take their lives and end up in the hospital. And so what's happening in our nation is very dark. It's horrific. And the only time we really hear about it is when celebrities take their lives. But it's happening all the time. And there's a reason for it. And I believe the reason for it is uh, in Hebrews 2, verse 15. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, 15, that every human being is subject to the haunting fear of death all their lifetime. That's what scripture says. And so I take issue with psychiatrists that say that people who are depressed have a mental disease. I don't believe they do. If you're depressed, you're not insane. You're intelligent. You're a thinker. You think about life because life is depressing. Even for the Christian, it can be somewhat depressing. Get out of bed with a sore back, you've got a sty in your eye, you've got a sore throat, you've got dandruff, you've got toothache, cars uh, need, needs fixing, there's uh, rats in your garage, there's always annoying problems, then there's the health problems on top of that, then there's the serious health problems, the fear of cancer, which is plaguing our nation, plus the fact that everything we love is going to be ripped from our hands by this thing called death, everything. And for the Christian, we have a living hope. The Bible calls the hope that we have a living hope, and it's an anchor to the soul. It's very real. It's like you're on the edge of a plane, 10,000 feet up, and you have the hope of a parachute. You put it on, and your trust is in the parachute. Well, now you're fearful about jumping, but you can control your fears. Your fear will be in direct proportion to the amount of faith you have in the parachute. If you have 100% faith in the parachute, you'll go, well, oh, let's go. 10,000 foot jump. Yippee, let's do it. No fear. If you have no hope, no faith in the parachute, no parachute, you are going to be horrified. And that's the state of the ungodly. They are haunted by the fear of death. Now, we can look at celebrities that take your lives and say they're rich, they're famous, they've got swimming pools, they've got cars, they've got fame, everything they could want, 
and it shows that you can't be happy without Jesus. I say you can. The problem that's bringing the depression is the more you've got, then the more you've got to lose when death comes to you. So celebrities are just like ordinary men of the street, but they're richer, they're more famous, they have better and bigger things, and the more they've got to lose when death takes them. And the problem is when a psychiatrist publicly says, or a celebrity comes out and says, I have mental problems because I'm depressed, that adds to their mental, that, sorry, that adds to their depression because that puts tremendous pressure on someone who's famous, the, the uh, media are watching them, and once they say I've got mental health problems, they're going to be watching to see what weird things they do next. Are they going to take their lives or not? No, you're not. You're a normal human being that thinks about the issues of life and death. And so that's the hope that we have for the ungodly, the glorious hope of the gospel. And that's what this book is about. Ray, <clears throat> you personally struggle with anxiety. Uh, yes. You share that in the book, and uh, you have been public about it, maybe uh, not an area that's been talked a lot about in uh, the circles that I travel in, but you have shared this and your way of dealing with it. And here's a man who is well known for the hope of the gospel, the promise of the gospel, but uh, to kind of turn a phrase, uh, the truth of the matter is this is our worst life now. Our best life is to come. And... and oh, and for many, this is the only heaven they're going to ever know. But for you and I, as believers in Jesus, this is the only hell that we're going to ever know. And so I really am living my worst life now. It's only going to get better in the life to come. But I have all these pressures. And it is, uh, as you know, in the Hebrew text, 45,000 individual Hebrew words in the Old Testament, not a single word for brain in there because it says, so a man thinks in his heart. So is depression, is anxiety, is that a heart disease, not a mental health disease? Yeah, it's, it's because of hopelessness. And you mentioned that uh, I'd had um, depression, depression problems or panic attacks years ago. Um, that gives me empathy for people like uh, Robin Williams, etc. cetera. Um, I want to commend the publishers, New Leaf Publishing, for taking on that book because I had a publicist trying to find me a publisher, and I've got lots of publishers. Uh, I wanted a secular publisher for this book. I didn't want it to be in the choir. I wanted to get out of there. For about two years, he tried to find a publisher, and everyone turned it down. New Leaf picked it up, and I'll tell you why it's difficult to publish a book on suicide. It's not a good issue to read about. If you've had someone commit suicide, you know a loved one, it's too raw. You don't want to go near it again. And if you haven't, then it's irrelevant. And so I've mixed celebrity with this issue. Uh, celebrities are tremendously fascinating for all of us. Most of us want to know what celebrities think, uh, what they believe, what they wear. Well, the world does. What they wear, what they eat, how much money they've got, what they're driving, etc. So... This is an intimate look at the beliefs of celebrities and why they get depressed and their thoughts about God, etc. And then after each celebrity, I have an imagine, imaginary witnessing session with people like Robin Williams and all these other celebrities that are in the book. Now, with Robin Williams, very funny guy, very talented, very intelligent, and very, very depressed. And I was able to empathize with him and say, look, back in 1982, I went into a deep, dark cavern that I couldn't get out of. And it was what, I didn't know what it was. I thought I was losing my mind. It was panic attacks. Three million Americans suffer from panic attacks, so they say. Uh, and it took a year for me to break free from that. I couldn't have a meal with my family for a whole year. And then I still had them for about five years after that. And I look back and I can say, well, it was good that I went through that because it's given me a comfort wherewith I can comfort other people like Robin Williams. So this book is unique in that aspect and that it takes on the negative of suicide, but it has the positive of what, what these atheists believe. And on the other side, the book called The Ledge, one of my great concerns in life is that I will come across someone who's on a ledge and, want, and wanting to commit suicide. And what am I gonna say to them? My words could cause them to jump off if I say the wrong thing. And so I formulated in my mind what I would say, and we have this, this uh, novel where I come across a guy on uh, Golden, uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge in the fog, 
who wants to take his own life. He's in his mid-20s, and I begin a conversation with him, and he's very cynical, very bitter, and he says, I'm going to do it. You can't stop me. And so I share with him a paradigm shift, and here's a paradigm shift. Most people would answer a certain way if I said this. A blind man who was born blind got on a bus. A man on the bus stood up and gave him his seat. Most people say, well, that's a very nice thing to do. It actually wasn't. It was a very stupid thing to do. The man lost his job because he did it, because he was the bus driver. Hearing extra information causes us to do a paradigm shift. We have a complete change of mind. We say something was good, and no, no, that was bad And when you hear more information. So I say to this young guy, I have information that will cause you to do a paradigm shift. You will do a 180. At the moment, you think the best thing you can do is kill yourself. And when you hear this information, you are going to completely change your mind and say, this is the worst thing I could ever do. And so the guy cynically says, okay, you religious nut, tell me a little story. And after some time, he says, please take hold of my hand, lift me up. It's very moving and it's very equipping for Christians as well as non-Christians to see how when we're in a depressive state, it's just like a, a tunnel. We can't see, can't even see the light in the tunnel. And uh, what the books do is turn on the light so you can see things clearly. Ray, you're, you, you, you've, for the last 35, 38 years, almost 40 years of your life, devoted yourself to the presentation of the gospel as uh, a foundation of faith, that logic, reason, and uh, that emotion, mind, will, and emotion, that soulish part of us that we seem to dwell in and live in, that we can be transported into being that spirit-filled, spirit-living li life and still wrestle as you did. Uh, I think it's incredibly motivating to me, uh, your transparency, that even uh, the great and revered Ray Comfort, who has touched the lives of tens of millions of people, uh, can go through this because there are things at work in our life that are overwhelming. They're hard to process. But through a lens of faith and the focus on the lens of faith as opposed to human reasoning, which we learned so much from the Greeks about human reasoning that we became too Greek. We stop being the spiritual beings of this definition that sin, according to God in Genesis, is a lack of faith. That is what he defines as sin. When he's talking about Abraham, and he's talking about Sarai, and he's talking about the Hagar situation, that lack of faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We've lost some of that fundamental, practical, reasoning of faith uh, in our discussions, in our pulpits, what can we do and how do we embrace this because our heart breaks for the Anthony Burdines, for the, for the, uh, 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 Robin Williams, etc. The, the, uh, all of them. Um, mm. and, and then you also examine uh, the lives and the final curtain of people who have not uh, a Rosie O'Donnell uh, still with us, uh, people who are still around as to how you might uh, confront and con have a conversation with them and reason with them from a faith perspective. Uh, yeah, most, most non-Christians, especially atheists, don't understand what we're talking about when we say faith. When the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please them, it doesn't necessarily mean a belief that God exists. The existence of God is axiomatic. When I meet an atheist, I can almost make him backslide in 30 seconds by asking one question. I say, so you're an atheist? He says, yeah. So you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. And he usually says, well, not nothing created everything. There was something. It just wasn't God. I say, well, let's just try and see why you don't want it to be God. And then you find out it's a moral issue, not an intellectual issue. They're like Adam, still running from God, hiding from God. They're like thieves, staying away from the police. They love the darkness, hate the light. Neither will they come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. When we're talking about faith, 
We're not talking about an intellectual belief that God exists. When I look at a building, I don't believe there was a builder. I know there was a builder. Anything else is stupid. Buildings don't build themselves. When I look at a painting, I don't believe there was a painter. I know there was a painter. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must first believe he exists or that he is, and he's the reward of those that diligently seek him. So when the Bible is speaking of faith, it's speaking of approaching God, trusting his integrity. And we live by faith every day. I'm, I'm exercising faith right at the moment. I'm sitting in a chair. I'm trust, trusting myself to it. We trust pilots. We get on a plane. We don't see the pilot, don't smell his breath or see his credentials. We trust our lives to him. When we go to a doctor, he says, take two of these each morning. We don't know if they're poisonous. We trust our lives to them. And so we exercise faith all the time. But people can let us down. God will never let us down. The Bible says he's without sin. It's impossible for God to lie. That means you can trust his integrity. When he says something, believe it. Trust it. Because it's an insult not to trust someone. Atheists that say, I don't believe what the Bible says. I say, what's your name? I'll say, Fred. I said, I don't believe that. So where do you live? He says, I live at such and such a street. I said, I don't believe that either. And their reaction is one would be to be upset, to be agitated because I'm calling them a liar by my lack of faith in their word. And I say, if you and me a man are upset by my lack of faith in your word, how much do you think you insult God by a lack of faith in his word? He that believes not God has made him a liar. Let none of you depart from the living God from an evil heart of unbelief. So I think that's a great thing to make clear to ungodly people that they can trust God. We all know he exists by creation, that without excuse, and that the issue is trusting in this promises. You know, I'm not out to, to convince people the Bible's the word of God. That's a lot to swallow. If I meet someone who says, I don't believe the Bible, okay, I might convince them that Noah built an ark by reasoning with them. But then I've got to try and convince them that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish, that Joshua stopped the sun, that, that Samson killed the thousand Philistines with a jawbone, a donkey spoke to Balaam. That's a lot to swallow. What I want him to believe is just a part of the Bible, the gospel. That's all I want him to believe. And once he believes, God will open the eyes of his understanding and the scriptures will come alive. And he'll realize that God has chosen foolish things to confound the wise. Uh, so... That's what I want to get to the heart of the ungodly. And the way to present the gospel is to proceed it with a moral law, as you said. When David took his five smooth stones towards Goliath, he didn't leave a sling back in his tent. He took his sling because the sling gave the stone its thrust. And it's the moral law, the Ten Commandments, that give the gospel its thrust. The Bible says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So if you've got a disease, the best way to convince you to take the cure is to talk about the disease. The gospel is the cure, and the best way to cause you to desire the cure is to talk about the moral law and how we're sinned against God through lying and stealing and lusting and hating people, committing murder in the heart. And that's when people will say, man, I'm a sinner. I need the Savior. The gospel will make sense to them. Ray, when somebody gets to the point where they begin to exhibit... Uh, some people are known to be depressed or known to use uh, excessive amounts of alcohol or drugs which were masking other issues in their lives. And when we look at many of, these, many of those who took their lives, we also saw that there was drug or alcohol use that was involved prior to this point <clears throat> as a warning sign. When we see that in our loved ones, <clears throat> uh, how should we approach this? Well, I don't know if alcohol and drugs are a warning sign because one of the scariest warning signs, someone's going to commit suicide, there are no warning signs. You know, almost the whole world masks pain with uh, alcohol and they get pleasure through alcohol. It, it, uh, it suppresses the areas that are normally inhibited so they can do things that they normally couldn't do uh, because the conscience gets to them. But if we see somebody that's um, depressed, or not depressed, they need the gospel. And so I don't want to talk someone out of suicide and have them end up in hell. I want to see them soundly saved and become part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. And believe me, we've got a huge problem, and the problem isn't with the world. The problem is with the church. We have 
men in pulpits who should have been motivational speakers or plumbers or electricians. They certainly aren't sons of thunder preaching righteousness in the great congregation. They don't talk about sin, righteousness, and judgment. They don't talk about the fear of the Lord. They talk about things on how to improve your life while sinners go to hell. And no wonder only 2% of the church, according to Bill Bright, regularly share their faith with others. If the church leaders have got no concern for the lost, they'll reproduce it themselves and have congregations that have no concern for the lost. Let me tell you something interesting. Um, a six-year-old boy in Texas had a, uh, a speech impediment. He had it from the age, well, from, from when he was born, his parents thought he had an aneurysm. He had speech therapy, therapy from the age of one through to six. And he was so bad with his speech, only his parents could understand what he was saying. But he was in a, a dentist chair and he was having it with a pediatric dentist. And she noticed that his lingual frenulum was short. That is the string under his tongue was a little short. And so she went to the parents and said, I can fix a speech impediment. Let me cut that lingual frenulum. And they gave permission and he, she came back and went snip. And the, sport, the boy spoke clearly. And we see a similar thing in Mark 7, verse 35. The Bible says there was a man with a speech impediment. He had an impediment in his speech. And Jesus said when he prayed for him, Ephatha, be opened. And the scriptures say, and the string of his tongue was loosed. And he spoke clearly. God did a little snip operation. And so when I look at people who are tongue-tied, that is the lingual frenulum is a little tied, they too embarrassed to talk about the gospel, don't know what to say, afraid of what people will say back to them, I think they need a little operation because I can see what the problem is. Their conscience is falling short of what it should be doing. So what I use is the cutting words of Charles Spurgeon, where he said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Very cutting words, but they do the job. If you are tongue-tied and you don't know what to say, you're too embarrassed or shy, you're more concerned about yourself and your feelings than you are that people are going to hell. So I trust the cutting words of Spurgeon challenged you, did something so that you go and speak clearly and no longer be tongue-tied when it comes to telling people about the gift of everlasting life that God has for them. Ray, is this lack of symptoms due to our lack of perception or our lack of relationship or uh, our continuing to receive a watered-down message, as you say, from the pulpit. Uh, this was prophesied by Paul that there was going to be a gospel preached that wasn't the gospel that I preached, a Holy Spirit preached that's different than the Holy Spirit I preached, and a Jesus that's different <clears throat> than the Jesus that I preached. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if we just get back to the basics, and that is sharing the love of Messiah, can we truly impact these lives? Yes, um, I think you nailed it a number, a number of cases, but I think there's one, there's one aspect that's very clear when it comes to Christians not sharing their faith. And I use an analogy. I say, Ray, could I get you to jump into a pool that's filled with icy water? and so cold that you would die within minutes of being in the actual water. You'd probably say, there's no way you're going to get me to do that. But if I said to you, there's a four-year-old boy that's drowning in that pond, you would jump in without a second thought because love overcomes fears. Yes. So if you're fearful to share your faith, don't pray for less fear. Pray for more love because that's the problem. Well, you are exactly right. We've been talking with Ray Comfort, author of The Dual Package, The Final Curtain, Fame, Fortune, and Feudal Lives, <clears throat> bundled with his novel, From the Ledge, A Conversation with Comfort. Ray Comfort, you have been a comfort to us, and we appreciate you so much for taking the time to be with us to share this on Revealing the Truth. May God bless all the works of your hand. We're going to take a short Thanks, break. Sir. And when we return, <clears throat> we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.